Who are we? What I really like about Men in Black 3 is we are reinventing the franchise. Action! And the real absolute necessity is to elevate it story-wise. You have laughs, and then tension builds up. And then you get to laugh again. Josh, he couldn't do an impersonation of Tom. He had to do an interpretation of the character that Tommy plays. All right. Will and I were both very mischievous, so we're having fun with this kind of back and forth. Action! And Barry has a remarkable inner meter in terms of what he wants a moment to be about. Right. Wow, that's men in black. Agent J and Agent K. Just felt great to see them back, just the same guys that we always knew. Woo! Yeah! That might be, baby. With Men in Black 3, it was a great homecoming. It's like that childhood fantasy jetpack <laughs> where you know stuff that other people don't know and there's a clever inventiveness to the creature a wonderful sense of humor yeah perfect but this one was harder than than all of the rest of them access restricted there was a lot of elements in it that made it difficult <laughs> One of the challenges for something like Men in Black is that you need to come up with a story that gives the audience what they expect from the franchise. Just one last thing, an eye exam. But then you also have to give them something more than that. The major necessity is deeper, that you've got to go deeper with the elements of story and character and revelation that you're delivering. Hey. Is it worth it? Oh, yeah, it's worth it. If you're strong enough. Although the Men in Black movies feel like they have big themes in terms of the world and the universe, it's really ultimately about characters and the relationship between people. Man, how did you get to be like you? Men in Black 3 is all about the two main characters discovering the secrets about their relationship. There are things out there you don't need to know. That's not the lie you told me when you recruited me. First of all, I'm the biggest fan of Will Smith and Tommy Lee Jones, and they're just like the most amazing, powerful duo together. You can just kind of kick back and, and, and marvel at uh, Tommy's cadence. He's going to demonstrate an electro-biomechanical neurotransmitting zero synapse reposition. And Tommy is, uh, is a force of nature, <laughs> truly uh, a maelstrom. Hey, what's up? You're extremely hot. <laughs> and Will is sort of a jack of all trades from writing to acting to everything you need. We had a scene outside the factory where it called for Agent J to jump out a window and stunts came in days earlier and built cranes and scaffolding. And I looked at the rehearsal and I just assumed that meant Will would do it. Here we go, everybody. Go. So I said, all right, Will, you're up. And no other actor would I even think that actor is going to do it. <laughs> but with Willie, you don't even think twice. God, I'm getting too old for this. I can only imagine how you feel. So we knew we needed to bring Will Smith and Tommy Lee Jones back together again. But we wanted to do something new and inventive. And what we've done is created not only a Men in Black movie, but also a time travel movie. Okay. Okay. There is nothing simple about time travel. It's almost like our brains can't really figure it out because there's always going to be a question you can't answer. Break the laser line? No, don't break it. Not, I mean when I'm fast enough. Sounds good. But 
it does give you great opportunities. See Will Smith go back to the 60s and see how he interacts with a time when, you know, America's really changing. It was really interesting. Hey, what kind of work do you do? Starting forward for the Detroit Darkies. Also, it seemed like this was time to see how Agent J and Agent K first met. K? How do you know my name? Josh Brolin comes in as the young Tommy Lee. He just is a wonderful image of the young K. Agent K, how are you? I'm good. OK, group hug on the way to doing what we're doing. I'm a fan of the franchise, so it really is kind of a, a dream come true in being asked to do something like this. But then you have to actually deal with doing it. And then all the fear and anxiety comes in. Because how are you going to break up, you know, one of the great iconic duos in movie history? And action. I said, well, I don't want to do a caricature because I find that that takes the humanity out of the person. So it became less about how am I going to do Tommy in finding a rendition of Tommy and then making it our own. We need pie. What? My granddaddy always said, if you got a problem that you can't solve, it helps to get out of your head. Pie It's good. Maybe K is the lighter one, and maybe J has gotten used to being with Tommy in the future, and when he goes back in the past, he's kind of taken on some of those curmudgeon -y attributes. What are you doing in your spare time, Strat? Oh. So maybe it's a flip. What's amazing is I keep thinking I'm directing one actor. The performance has been so consistent that it's really hard for me to tell where Tommy Lee Jones ends and Josh Brolin begins. You lose something over here, Hondo? And what was interesting about bouncing back and forth with Tommy and Josh, it was almost the identical chemistry. Oh, I have a line. <laughs> and for Josh to be able to step into that and not just deliver Tommy, but deliver chemistry, that's unheard of. We got some real actors in this thing, that you throw that level of talent into this type of movie, it creates a fantastic magic. I'm gonna go to the little men's in black room, then we'll go find those morons from Pox and Thera. Lunch is on me. One of the goals or the tricks of working on a Men in Black story is to try to put it inside of a kind of a cop narrative that you feel comfortable with. Boris the Animal. Put him away a long time ago. It's the worst mistake I ever made. So Men in Black 3 is the story of a long last villain going after your partner. I feel younger already. Our villain on this movie is named Boris the Animal. It's just Boris. He's played by Jermaine Clement who's a incredibly great New Zealand actor and songwriter. Rather hot in here, isn't it? Mind if I open a window? He has to sort of perform as if he's learned the English language as a second language, yet still be understandable. And we've decided he learned it through sort of British diction tapes. You can't win, Morris. There's too many of us. Mm, let's agree to disagree. They described him as a kind of weird, like, <laughs> psychopath. <laughs> so uh, who wouldn't want to be one of those? <laughs> also, the great thing about Boris is that I'm like my own henchman. That's not possible. It's hard enough remembering one set of lines, but then I had to do one Boris set of lines and do the other one and react to them. So that was tricky. What's your plan? Prevent the Arknet from being deployed. Kill anyone who tries. Good plan didn't work. He's so dry. He's so deadpan. And yet there's something about Jermaine which is very physically imposing. He's kind of a big, strong guy. And this combination of almost comic detachment. The big one. And a real sense of power. <laughs> And Jermaine is unique in that way, that he can deliver the comedy, but also, in a legitimate way, fulfill what a villain has to do. Sorry, darling. We did love the cake. 
His name's Griffin the Arcane, and he's a fifth dimensional being, last of its species. Let's Griffin. go, Matt! Oh! When I sat down to write Griffin, to me, he represented a really important theme in the movie, which is fate and whether or not you can escape it. Negative possibilities are multiplying as we speak. 20 seconds. Right, wait. He was really written as a hybrid between string theory, physics, and kind of a Zen master. The bitterest truth is better than the sweetest lies. <laughs> Griffin is unique in one sense, is that he is purebred alien coming as he is. Damn. And Barry was very specific in terms of how to play him. We found an interesting balance of someone who is curious and anxious about the situation that he finds himself in. This is gonna be interesting. Michael brought to Griffin an incredible sense of positivity and it lends to a character who's about fate a great sense of optimism. This is my new favorite moment in human history. The new Men in Black is run by a woman, Emma Thompson. She's both strong and sardonic, like Zed was, but really funny. When I told the Phoenician Zyglot about Zed's passing, she said something that I'm going to repeat. <laughs> Technically, it's very demanding because it's often an awful lot of chat or very quick physical stuff. Ah! <laughs> that has to walk a very fine line between being absolutely serious but also funny. He imprisoned Boris. He did not put up the arc light because apparently that's in Iron Man and it's not clear. The training was all in comedy, so I'm very lucky. But you've got to be funny and you've got to hold your end up. You've got to know your stuff. Having cast Emma, she brings with her the quality which is essential to be in Men in Black, which is you play comedy straight. It's always my theory, surround your absurd situation. Catastrophic earth attack imminent. With the realest acting you can have, and you'll have great comedy. It's a very wise man. With Barry, you're carving out moments. And we improvise a lot. There's a lot of ad-libbing and all that. Ship sail, horse. Or, or Amigo. Uh, I don't know. Um, or Honda. I'll just use my imagination. And Barry's been so open in terms of listening to what kernels of wisdom we have found in the playing of it. So the script has become a kind of jumping off point in terms of what the possibilities are. Come on, everybody. Let's do one more rehearsal. We'd rehearse at night before we shot the next day. And therefore, we were allowed to find the scene and find the truth in the scenes. This is really rare on studio films. They're very, very big movies, these, but what's interesting to me is it doesn't feel like a big movie on set. It feels like the kinds of movies I make. And I think that's admirable and, and remarkable. Cut. Great. Let's move on. Men in Black 1 and 2 were both, all the stage work was done in L.A. and they came to New York just for locations. This movie even has decided to shoot the whole thing here. My theory is, if there are aliens on Earth, where would they hang out and be able to pass New York? There's a sequence that takes place in Coney Island. And because Coney Island's this crazy place, you know, there's like just weird looking people. But if you look in the background, you'll see these aliens that we've made. You have to look for it, you know? <laughs> in addition, New York crews were really fantastic. They have great senses of humor. All right, this is the rehearsal. Can we clear everyone out of there, please? <laughs> so there's an energy when you're in New York that sort of invades your whole thinking process, which is why shooting in New York is so great. Every day when I come in on set, I'm just blown away. And how they create the magic behind everything and the detail that they put in. It's amazing. Bill, which is better, the fast pushing like that or the uh, uh, uh? I think Barry's smart in that he surrounds himself with a lot of good people. So many people in this film are really talented in the top of their craft. 
we have Ken Ralston, who's won six Academy Awards, and he's been on the set the whole time. He is towards the end of the shot, it just goes dead center. He has an associate, Jay Red, and the great thing about working with Ken and Jay is it's all about reality. I think we have to pull a yellow out of this thing for some of these shots. Can we play, are, are there any darks we can play up in it? When we first got involved in it, he wanted it to feel more gritty, more realistic, as things were really a part of the world that Men in Black is and just integrated into these environments, really, so you believe they were standing in them. The Lunar Prison, you have to feel like this place really exists. We've created a computer version of all the cells, which looks just like it, so we can do some really large, huge shots of this place. And all of this stuff is based on Bo's design. This is the Neuro Life, 1969. I've done four movies now with Bo. He thinks like a director, he designs like a director. What really was exciting about Men in Black 3 is the underlying concept, which combines irony and props, their vehicle. There are some very interesting new devices we use in Men in Black 3. We have new guns. No, 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 space gun. That's what I'm talking about. Also, new neuralizers. Josh Brolin and Will Smith have to chase our villain on monocycles. And they really did make practical versions of these. They made some that were just big hoops. They made some that kind of drove on a sort of ATV vehicle. We've made some really interesting Men in Black cleanup devices. Step away from the orb. The real deal, time jump here. And there's a great alien device that allows people to jump time. So the production design on Men in Black 3 is really astonishing. And Men in Black headquarters is actually to scale. I mean, it's life size. It's a large set. A lot of the stuff also was manufactured, fabricated in Los Angeles and trucked out in pieces and assembled here. And it was a real race to have it all be put together nicely. It was built in a warehouse that was used to train and keep horses in the army in the 1880s in Brooklyn. So it's a huge set. And there were scores of aliens <laughs> walking around in it. I've got Rick Baker designing all the aliens who's won seven Academy Awards. I've made more aliens for this film than both Men in Blacks combined, you know, times 10, I think. You know? Since Men in Black 3, there's this whole time travel element. I thought it would be cool if we did things that look like different aliens from old 60s movies and 50s movies and stuff. And to be able to do my version of those kind of classic science fiction aliens was a lot of fun. Yeah, come here. It's fish man. You could say that if you've seen one alien, you've seen them all, but that's really not true. Rick is so creative. Every alien's a fascinating thing. Can't take your eyes off of it. So the world that we're creating for Men in Black 3 is incredibly visual, and all of us as a team have a singular unified viewpoint. And it's very distinctly Barry Sonnenfeld. It's sort of the shape of the world Good. from Barry's head. Well, Barry's incredibly eccentric ah. and incredibly fun. <laughs> Walter. <laughs> Guys, you know, from another world. Barry's mind is twisted in how he just comes up with and creates these scenes and scenarios. The fish is going to eat you when it's coming up your legs. You grab, and we'll rehearse all this. There's a scene that takes place in a Chinese restaurant that has Boris in it, but also some aliens in the restaurant themselves. So. And Bob here is a clear violation of Health Ordinance 32. 
And Barry found this picture on the internet of this snot-colored lump of fish, you know? With this really kind of sad face and a big nose. It's like something that's too stupid to design. You wouldn't design something that looked like that. Hey! And it really exists. So we made this thing that looks exactly like this crazy big lump fish. Action! We just did a scene today where Will was on the monocycle, and I looked over at Barry, because I was off camera, and I looked at Barry, and Barry was so into it, it was like he was having a seizure or something. <laughs> he definitely has a style in what he professionally does, but it's the energy that he brings to the set that makes this franchise what it is. You couldn't have the franchise without Barry. You gotta aim the nozzles in. Yeah, that's great. Spears picking up by the engine. You're in the control center monitoring to go above and below. Command module Jack getting ready for launch. Here's Jack King and launch control. We knew we needed a great ending to this movie, one that felt like it was fitting for the, you know, the latest part of this franchise. And I struggled with that for a bit. Uh, it's just one small step. But in 2009, it was the 40th anniversary of the Apollo launch. And I was looking at the newspaper and all of a sudden realized, of course, that's where this thing has to end. It gave us a focus for where this movie had to head. But it certainly also gave us a big production headache. It's a challenging thing to try to pull off contemporary action in a historical context like that. Just past the two minute mark in the countdown. It's a very recognizable event, and there was a huge amount of detail and a huge amount of work that went into building all of this stuff. On set, they had built a two section tall version of the gantry, as well as one of the gantry arms, and the topmost part of the Apollo capsule. The rest of the gantry, the rocket, all of that stuff is all created digitally. All the steam and smoke and everything is all digital. We actually had to treat the steam and smoke really as another character. As pretentious as it sounds, there's performance to some of the clouds. Again, let's watch our element of uh, K sitting here. We don't want to cover them up that much. That's pretty good. And our responsibility in character animation was doing a lot of the more extreme Boris configurations. There was stuff where he's shooting quills at Agent J and K. Every day I turn up, they're strapping me to something and flinging me around. Even with a harness, just looking over, uh, just say a 20 or 30 foot precipice. That's sort of enough to make me nervous. There were a lot of shots that were just too impractical or too dangerous to shoot, not only with the real actors, but even with stuntmen. And so we did different shots of completely digital doubles, which was a really great challenge because this stuff has to intercut with the real actors. <laughs> And you've got these big sweeping camera moves as well. So it gives a big kind of epic quality to the whole launch tower, which is really gigantic, but it made that whole scene much more complex. It's a, a difficult balancing act because there's so many elements that could go wrong in any individual shot. But Barry's done a really good job of working from the spine. And the spine is the relationship between J and K. See why I recruited you. You're good man. By the end of it, something is stuck up on you. And you realize that this has been a journey that wasn't just one of comedy or science fiction or visceral action, but that there was a legitimate emotional journey here. Hey, my name's K. What's your name? James. James? That's a nice name. And one of the things that Agent J comes to learn in saving his partner is that he does so at the price of his father's life, which we really felt makes him a true hero. But it's a tough moment. <laughs> it really makes you understand the love between these two characters and that the true origin story is a young 
Agent K becoming a surrogate father for Agent J. James. I, I think it's emotionally true. When you can come up with a story and a set of characters that have the right to live on beyond one or two or three movies, I think it's a meaningful accomplishment. And I think this is a really kind of a lovely myth. It's clever, and it's fun, it's poignant, it's interesting, and it's a sense of a new birth. Between Barry, Will, and one of the most amazing crews I've ever worked with, I've had a blast on this movie. A blast. If we succeed in what we're trying to do, the audiences will be amused and amazed and also moved. Wow. Anytime you go to work with Will Smith, it's going to be a happy day. Will and Barry together make it an even happier day. Cut. Very good. Hey, don't even worry about it. <laughs>